Let's come back to approaches for acute care, yeah. let's say infections, antibiotics. I think we're all on the same page. Let's be very careful with their use. And we on the podcast in the past have discussed so many interesting studies, garlic versus fluconazole for vaginal yeast equivalency, herbal antimicrobials versus rifaximin for SIBO equivalency, probiotics versus fluconazole equivalency and yeah. different models of infection or overgrowth. So there's just so many tools here that we can use. The one thing that I think may trip up parents is fear, right? Yes. So a child, yeah. I really care about them. I don't want to make a mistake. You know, the the person in the hospital with the white coat who's really authoritative is saying, well, this is what you have to use. You know, there's not quite as much discussion of these tools for children. So you're probably the most qualified person to speak to this uh, as a pediatrician who's using these holistic tools. Yeah. What do parents know about alternatives to antibiotics or other alternative therapies to use in an acute setting? Yeah. Well, so, you know, this is such an important topic and one topic that I, you know, I, there's so many things I want, want parents to understand, but, and children too, but, you know, in my book, I actually have one entire chapter that I, I wrote actually for practitioners and parents and kids. Um, that's entirely about what I want parents and practitioners to understand about antibiotics. It's a whole chapter. And then mm. the whole last section, part four of the book is all about the um, the integrative tools that I've learned over the past 20 years to manage the most common acute conditions in kids and with the goal of helping your kids get better faster because we know in conventional pediatrics when your kids are sick, what's there to do? It's just wait and watch, right? It's supportive care. Right. Or if they're sick long enough, you get the antibiotics. So these tools like homeopathy, essential oils, acupressure, herbal medicines can get them you know, faster, better, faster, and also have the goal of reducing the, the use of unnecessary antibiotics. Because in some studies, up to 70% of antibiotics are inappropriately prescribed for children. And, yeah. um, you know, when I, there's, there's a list of six questions that I recommend all parents ask the prescribing physician before they start oh, antibiotics, right? Yeah, the great. number one, the number one question, it's so simple. It's just asking, hey, doc, is this antibiotic really necessary? I mean, there's no rocket yep. science to that, but guess what? Some studies have shown that doctors are twice as likely to prescribe an antibiotic if they think the patient wants one, even if they think mm. it's not going to help, like even if they Makes think it's sense. for a viral indication. And so just by asking that, because I've, I've worked in busy, busy urgent care centers where there are some parents who the, come in with the goal of just walking out with a prescription. But just right. by asking that question, it is opening the door to have a conversation and letting that physician know, oh, okay, you want to be more thoughtful about this. And to the and to the doctor's credit, I think a lot of doctors, you know, they're they're trying to work within the preferences of the patient. Yes. And so now you're giving them an indication of what your preference is rather than the clinician just having to guess at what it is. That's right. And also and because there is some wiggle room there, even for in ear infections, the the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends this kind of watchful waiting approach for two to three days, right. you know, for kids who aren't super young or really sick. Um, and yet, you know, in, in some studies, they found that most pediatricians are, aren't really doing that. But if they know, but pediatricians know those recommendations. If you say, you know, hey, is there is there anything, you know, do, do I really need to start the antibiotics or my child's ear infection? Um, and they say, they might say, and they hopefully will say, you know, yeah, we have a couple of days, you know, two, three days. Here you go. Here's the prescription. And I'll do this with patients too. Here's a prescription. Why don't you, let's wait and see. And you can always start um, if your child gets worse. Now, in the two to three days though, what we want, what I want parents to know is what can you do in the meantime, right? You know, you don't want your kid to suffer. And unfortunately, you know, ibuprofen, I, you know, I, I was um, reading this one article and I was really dismayed because for fevers and for pain, I'd been recommending ibuprofen over acetaminophen because acetaminophen or Tylenol reduces your glutathione mm. levels, which can harm your ability to fight mm. infections. But in this one study, ibuprofen was found to disrupt the microbiome as much as antibiotics. So I'm like, ah, so... 
Wow. Yeah. yeah. So we still need to support our, our kids' microbiomes. And, and when we learn how to use herbal medicines like garlic eardrops and homeopathic medicines like ferrum phosphoricum and use acupressure points like, you know, large intestine four and anti-inflammatory essential oils like lavender, I guarantee you most kids, they're going to recover from their ear infections without needing antibiotics. And so that's why I want parents to have all these tools. And, and as you said, you know, for, you know, I've been doing this for 20 years. And, um, you know, what, what we really want to practice is, is evidence-based medicine, but that term has become skewed. <laughs> And evidence-based medicine Agreed. does not mean just what is in the literature because we know it can take 17 years, 40 years, you know, for the literature to catch up to clinical practice. And sometimes the literature just isn't there, right? Because kids' research is kind of bottom of the barrel. And so evidence-based medicine is, yes, grounded on the, the current available research. It's also grounded on clinical experience. Experience. So over the 20 years, I've just learned, you know, what works, what doesn't work, um, you know, what what are my top recommendations for most kids, and then three, as you said, patient preference. So you know, there's lots of choices here, and so I just, I, you know, I'm all about empowering, empowering parents because, I mean, your kids usually get sick in the middle of the night, <laughs> and so rather than you know sitting there wondering, oh my gosh, should I go to the ER? What can I do? Calling the the insurance, you know, nurse line that isn't always the most helpful. Um, it gives you the tools for how I approach exactly what I tell patients, um, you know, when they have any of these, you know, top 25 very common acute conditions like earaches, sore throats, fevers, um, colds, flus, vomiting, diarrhea, and, you know, you name it. Yeah. So just a great resource for parents to have as, as like a reference to flip to when they invariably get hit by one of these 25 things. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I was hoping for in part four, that that wasn't something to read. I mean, parts three, or I want everyone to read. And then part four is like your, your bedside reference, like, oh, they're starting to cough right now. Okay. Flip through to the cough section. Oh, I, maybe this homeopathic medicine looks like it might fit, or maybe I'll go get this herb from, you know, the, right. um, the local health food store and see if that helps. And, and you know, another point I wanted to build upon from your evidence-based comment is there's less funding for natural therapeutics. So there tends to be less data on those, but it's not to say that there's data disproving and there's oftentimes some data actually proving. It might be only one or a few randomized control trials, but there they are nevertheless. And sadly, what happens in some cases I've seen is, is sort of this, this arrogant use and sort of commandeering of the term evidence-based medicine, yeah. rather to say, I don't like that sort of healthcare. I don't like natural agents. So I'm going to proclaim that I have the high ground here morally and scientifically and plant a flag of evidence-based medicine. And that's really kind of bastardizing the term That's where right. evidence-based medicine should also look at the invasiveness of the therapy. And if it's a more invasive therapy, but it has larger and more RCTs versus a smaller therapy in terms of maybe one or only a couple RCTs, but it's less invasive and less expensive than at least a therapeutic trial on that agent first. So yeah. garlic first, and then, yeah. then considering the antibiotic is probably the most evidence-based recommendation. I mean, I, I love that. And, I, and I'm so, I mean, we're so aligned on so many of these things. It's always so great to talk with you. Um, but, you know, one of the things too is um, when I'm looking at trials, even if the quote natural therapy proves to be as effective and not more effective, you know what? I'm going to take that. You know, if a study shows me that walking in nature is as effective at, you know, treating depression as an SSRI antidepressant medication, oh, yeah. guess which I'm going to choose, right? Because we know, I mean, the same thing with SSRIs, they, there, are, there are treatment failures, they stop working eventually for many people. And, you know, as I was doing research for the book and really looking at all the different medications that can disrupt the gut microbiome, you know, SSRIs are up there. And, and what's fascinating, I mean, not fascinating, unfortunate is that, you know, for a lot of our kids and adults, they've come to this place of chronic unwellness or chronic disease because of their gut microbiome disruption. And then we're piling on medications like, you know, maybe long-term antibiotics or um, 
steroids or SSRIs or antihistamines and, um, you know, reflux medications, all of these meds that have been shown in, in the research to disrupt the gut microbiome. So we may be getting some temporary relief, but I think we're, for a lot of the time, we're trading the short-term relief for long-term, you know, maybe worse outcomes. So not to be scary for any patient or child who's on these medications, but just to say, you got to work on the gut. I mean, even if you're on these medications, you still have to work on the gut and, and support the microbiome if you're going to have the best chance at either weaning those medications or if the medications are helping you, great, but medications start, they stop working at some point, a lot of them. So having that microbiome foundation is going to ensure that you're just going to keep moving forward.